Hi, I'm Wes Gale. Welcome to the program. Today we're going to be talking about estimates. Everyone is going to be asked to do estimates at some point in their career, whether it's to estimate how long it's going to take you to do something or to prepare a budget. You're going to have to do an estimate. Project managers are going to have to do much larger, more complex estimates. They're going to have to sort out how long it's going to take one or more people to do something. They're going to have to figure out what the budget should be for that effort. They're going to have to set a date for when that effort will be completed. They're going to face estimates on a regular basis. In our video cast series on estimation, we're going to look at the purposes, the dimensions, and the political complexities that surround the estimation process. In this first show, we're going to provide you something of a primer, an academic look at estimation, so you have some important understandings that you'll need to build upon when we go into our later shows. We'll look at the practical aspects of estimation, as well as how Kale Partners recommends that you develop your estimates. So how about we take a look at what we're going to discuss today. We have three topics we're going to cover. We'll start off with understanding estimation, which is a brass tacks look at what is an estimate and what purposes do estimates serve. We'll then move on to how estimates work, at least academically speaking. This is meant to foreshadow that in our second show we'll talk about how estimates work practically speaking. But for now, we're going to focus upon the academic side of things and lay a theoretical foundation for you that you'll use later on. We'll do that by looking at three topics. First of all, we'll explore how estimates are really all about confidence, how confident you are at a given forecast you have of a future outcome. We'll then look at the case of two estimators who have been asked to estimate the exact same thing and how they can have very different profiles for their estimate. And what this example does is it's a nice segue into the final point here of how estimates are really shaped by two forces. The amount and quality of information that you have and the caliber of the judgment that you bring to assessing that information. And then we'll close by looking at a very simple example of estimating the cost for constructing a table. Although extremely simple, it'll be very helpful in illustrating the principles that we've discussed up to this point. So, with no further ado, let's move on. What is an estimate? Simply stated, an estimate is a forecast or prediction of what an outcome might be in the future. In essence, you're looking into your crystal ball and you're figuring out what the future will be. Now, we might be estimating almost anything. We might be estimating how much fuel it would take to get you someplace. We might estimate the cost to build something. We might estimate the profit we'll make from a new product. It doesn't really matter what it is, but what's important to understand is that as a prediction, an estimate is essentially our guess of what the future might be. And as we've said in earlier shows, we hate guessing, so the goal of our estimation process is to take as much of the guesswork out of delivering the estimate as is possible. We want to come up with a very good number about what we're doing. The next thing we have to understand about estimates is why we do them. That's pretty straightforward. Within organizations, we have to make a great many decisions. Among the decisions that have to be made within said organizations, they have to decide what projects they're going to do and not do. They're going to have to choose among different approaches to pursuing the projects they've decided to go after. And they have to figure out what things are worth to them now and in the future. And all of this requires decision makers to make choices among potentially competing courses of action. And this is what investment decisions are all about. I have to decide what I'm going to do today, what it's worth to me today, and what it's going to yield for me tomorrow. And how estimates are useful is that they establish numeric values for both sides of the investment decision. They can determine the expected return, how much I'm going to get for doing something, as well as the expected cost of doing it. And by denominating the return and the cost, estimates serve the two purposes of informing the planning of the decision makers, as well as setting their expectations about how they should feel about what they decided to do and how they're going to do it. So in essence, estimates set the expectation guardrails for how we expect the future to unfold. Now, estimates have some important attributes that you should understand. First of all, they should be quantitative in nature. While it may be simpler to provide a qualitative assessment, like I give this a high probability of success, this is really in the realm of pure guesswork, which is what we're trying to avoid. So in order to inform decision making, you need to denominate your estimates in quantitative figures. Secondly, and this is very important, estimates are not actual values. They're estimates. They're an approximate calculation that you do now of what you think the actuals will be in the future. And this is a very important distinction. You probably run across this dealing with the finance folks on budgeting issues where they make a very hard distinction between what is in the budget, an estimate, and what has been spent, an actual. However, as we'll discuss shortly, this distinction may get lost in some of your stakeholders as they begin to perceive that the estimate, the budgeted figure, is the actual. It is the number that you must hit. There is no distinction between the two, even though in reality there is. 
But for our purposes now, we need to understand that an estimate is not an actual. The two are very different. Next, estimates are not certain to occur. There is a certain probability that your estimated figure will be realized, but there's no guarantee that that will be the number. Otherwise, you'd have a perfect crystal ball and you wouldn't be watching this video cast. But the fact of the matter is, is that estimates are a guess. It may be your best guess, it may be someone else's best guess that this number, this estimate will be realized, but there's no certitude around that. You're really providing a figure that has a certain probability of occurring in the future. And we'll talk more about what that means when we get to probability distributions in just a second. And finally, an estimate reflects one individual's assessment, it reflects your assessment of the situation. But another individual with the exact same information, looking at the exact same problem, may have a very different estimate of the situation. So estimates are personal in nature. Until they're approved to become the organization's estimate, they're really just yours. Okay, let's now dive deeply into the heart of estimation, and that heart is all about confidence. You see, for an estimate to be useful in informing decision making or setting expectations, it has to be a good estimate. And when we say we need a good estimate, what we're saying is that this is an estimate we have confidence in. I mean, what would be the point of using a bad estimate? But the fact that there is a good estimate, there's an estimate that we have confidence, implies that there could be a bad estimate, an estimate that we don't have any confidence in. And the presence of those two types of estimates really tells us that there's a range of potential estimates, there's a distribution of estimates that we could choose from, but we're actually choosing one number when we're asked to provide an estimate. And let's illustrate what we mean by that by looking at an example. Let's suppose you've been asked to estimate something. It could be anything. In this case, we're going to assume you have to implement a new software application. Okay? Without doing any research, just based upon what you know about the business, Let's say that you feel that implementing this application will take no more than 15 man months. And when we say man months, we're using a level of effort metric here. It's not 15 months to do, you think it's going to take 15 man months. If you had three people, it'll take five months to do, or any number of combinations of those. But you're using man months as your metric in this case, and you believe under no circumstances should this take more than 15 man months to do. You also feel that under optimal conditions, if everything went right, the soonest you could get this done, the least effort that would be required, would be three man months. And what these two numbers describe is a range of potential outcomes. In the very best case, you could be done in three man months. What we're showing here is A. In the very worst case, it shouldn't take any longer than 15 man months in order to complete this project. So you have a range of some 12 man months here. Now both of these cases are what we call worst and best scenarios. And there's a very low probability of these two numbers occurring. And by applying a probability scale to these, we would say that there's a very low probability of either of these outcomes occurring. You can't imagine that you'd be so fortunate in order to complete this in three man months. Likewise, you can't imagine you'd be so unlucky as to require 15 man months of effort in order to complete this. And that's why we refer to these as limits, the lower limit and the upper limit. They're also known as extremes. And in between these two limits, in between these two extremes, is where the truth lies about what will be required to complete this project. Now, just as these two extremes have a very low probability of occurrence, near zero, there's got to be an estimate that has a higher probability of occurrence. In fact, there's got to be one number that is the most likely outcome that we are going to witness here. And we're going to say that that most likely outcome has a 20 plus percent chance of occurring and it is at nine man months. Now miraculously as you do the math here you'll see that nine man months happens to be the midpoint between the two extremes. But this third estimate is really just another point in the distribution of potential estimates that range between three man months and 15 man months. In fact if we were to plot all of those potential estimates, it might look something like this. Now this curve is called a normal distribution curve. If you're interested in statistics, there are all sorts of things you could say about this curve, but for our purposes, there are really just two observations that we want to make. First of all, the area underneath the curve on both sides of the most likely estimate are equal. So there's a 50% probability that this project will take nine or fewer man months, and there's a 50% probability that this project will take nine man months to 15 man months. Basically, they're mirror images of one another. And secondly, 
When you pick a given estimate number, suppose you pick nine man months or ten man months, whatever, what you're really saying is that you have a probability of achieving that number or less. Let me explain. If I were to say that I think this project will take nine man months to do, well, really what I'm saying is that given this distribution of potential outcomes, there's a 50% probability that I'll hit nine man months or less. There's actually a 20% probability or 22% probability, if you look at D here, that I'll hit nine man months specifically. But if I say I think this will take nine man months, there's really a 50% chance that it will take nine man months or less. It'll take between three and nine man months. Relatedly, if I were to say that I think this project will take 15 man months to complete, what I'm essentially saying is that I'm 100% confident that this project will take 15 man months or less. Now, I'm actually almost 0% confident it'll take exactly 15 man months, but if I estimate 15 man months, I'm very confident it will be less than or equal to 15 man months. So when you provide someone an estimate, say 9 man months in this case, you're really not saying that this project is going to take exactly 9 man months of effort to complete. What you're saying is that I'm confident that this effort will require 9 man months or less of effort. You're actually reserving all lesser amounts, all the amounts to the left of that 9 man months is within inside your estimate. So when you provide that estimate 9 man months and someone says, I accept your estimate of 9 man months, they're really not going to hold you to consuming exactly 9 man months of effort. They just don't want you to go over 9 man months. So if you come in at 8 man months or 6 man months or 5 man months, that's all good. What they don't want you to do is come in at 10, 11, or 12 man months. So an estimate is reserving all the lesser estimates to the left of the number that you provide. A very important distinction we'll talk about when we get to estimation strategies in our second show. Okay, let's move on to look at the case of two different people providing an estimate on the exact same thing. So looking at the case of two estimators, let's assume that they've been asked to estimate the exact same project and they have the exact same information available to them and that we're going to ask them to provide their distributions, their probability distributions of what they think the maximum estimate would be, the minimum estimate, the mean, and all the points in between, and then let's compare those estimation distributions to see what we can learn from them. In the case of individual one, this is the distribution we saw on the previous slide, where there's a minimum of three man months, a maximum of 15 man months, and a mean of nine man months, and it's a normal distribution. But individual two is a very interesting case. This two is a normal distribution. However, you'll notice that it looks very different than the distribution that we see from individual one. And that the extremes are 1.5 man months and 6 man months, and that the mean is 3.75 man months. We can also see that there's a higher probability of both the means and the extremes. So although a normal distribution, this is a very different distribution than what we see for individual one. And what we can say about these distributions are as follows. First of all, as we've said, they're both normal distributions. The left hand is a mirror image of the right hand. Secondly, the second distribution has a much tighter range. Instead of a 12-man month range between the two extremes, it's only four and a half man months. And if you were a manager evaluating these two estimation profiles, you would probably be inclined to select individual two's estimation profile if only for the fact that there's less variability in it. Something about individual two's estimate makes him much more confident that the outcomes will be in a much narrower range than what individual one feels. And since we always prefer more certainty to less certainty, individual two's estimation profile would be preferred. But finally, and perhaps more importantly, it is also a lower range. Clearly individual two believes the effort required to implement the software application is much less than what individual one has estimated. But individual two also sees that there are some outcomes those between 1.5 man months and 3 man months, that the individual one could not see as possible outcomes for this particular effort. So the question then comes up as to why these two profiles are so different. Is it just because their opinions of the situation are different? Or is it something else? Specifically, is it the quality of the information available to the individuals, or is it the quality of their judgment in evaluating that information? 